Welcome, members and guests, to the Australian Institute of International Affairs of Western Australia to this special event, this webinar. My name is Brendan Augustine, and I'm the president of uh, the Institute here in Western Australia. We have the pleasure of organizing this particular webinar in conjunction with our sister organization, the AIA of Tasmania. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are assembling tonight and where I'm speaking from, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. I acknowledge the elders, past and present, as well as emerging. And I thank them for their leadership and custodianship of the land on which we are gathering tonight. We're very privileged uh, tonight because we have two special guests who have given up their evening at various times uh, to speak about this very contemporary topic about Malaysian politics. The Malaysian general election was held on the 19th of November, 2022. And as most audience members will note, will, will recall, the election results were quite unique in that for the first time in Malaysia's history, it delivered a hung parliament. That resulted in a few days of uncertainty, but after five or so days, Datuk Siri Anwar Ibrahim, the leader of Pakatan Harapan, the coalition with the largest number of seats, was appointed prime minister. The journey to that was not clear, and we will go through that in our discussion with our two special guests. Let me introduce our special guests. Dr. James Chin, he's a vice president of the Australian Institute of International Affairs of Tasmania, a professor at University of Tasmania, and a very frequent commentator both in Australia and overseas on contemporary Malaysian politics. We also have with us Mr. Jahaba Sadiq, who has been a journalist in Malaysia and in the region since about 1988. He is also, like James, a frequent commentator on Malaysian politics and politics of the region. Without further ado, let me start the discussion with, a, with a, the initial question. And just for the audience, can I remind you that, can I note to you that the question and answer function of the Zoom webinar is turned on and you are most welcome to type in your questions. We will talk, we will have these discussions for about an hour, but the, your questions will be collated and as moderator, I will um, group them together and post them to our, our two guest speakers. Um, and if during the conversation it is relevant to the topic that we are discussing at the time, I might introduce the question uh, during the first part of the uh, discussion. I will try to get through all the questions and I'll give you enough time, uh, particularly at the back end, to have a, a, a long and involved discussion with our two guest speakers. To set the scene, can I invite our two speakers to spend a few minutes, maybe five to eight minutes each, providing us perhaps their four to five key main learnings from the results of the 19 November elections? What did the results tell us about the state of contemporary Malaysian politics? I will start first with Jahaba, and please, after that, James, to follow on. Go ahead, please, Jahaba. Hi, good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me for this event. Um, so I think, you know, uh, the run up to the elections was uh, exceptional because uh, it follows uh, what happened in 2018. And, uh, and subsequently, we elected the world's oldest prime minister, or rather, the world's oldest prime minister became prime minister. And then he subsequently lost his mandate in, in, in within 23 months because members of his uh, party decided to part ways with the other coalition partners. and and. We've had more prime ministers in in uh, four years than we ever had in sixty years in that, in that sense, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So what has happened? What what are the lessons we've learned from that? Was the elections were called in haste in a sense that 
Amno, uh, the former uh, and long-running uh, linchpin of the government, decided to uh, force an election because they wanted uh, power themselves without sharing it with with their erstwhile allies, uh, Bersatu, and past the Islamist party. And so after a long roundabout way, we got the prime minister, Ismail Sabri, um, to actually dissolve parliament and hold elections November 19th. Now, obviously everyone expected uh, that a snap election would favor Amno because they were most prepared for it. Uh, unfortunately, um, what we have learned from the election results on November 19 is very simple. Um, that the one uh, major uh, electorate bank in Malaysia, the civil service, uh, finally uh, swung out from AMNO and decided to support Bersatu and PAS. And you could see the sweep in many uh, rural seats and, and more importantly, in the seat of the government in Putrajaya, the administrative capital, uh, that seat, which was traditionally won by, by AMNO since its inception in 1998, went to Bersatu, went to a senator who was considered a no-hoper, uh, a useless uh, education minister, as it were, uh, and he won. So the first thing, uh, first uh, point you can get out of this election was that the civil service abandoned AMNO and decided to stick it, stick in with Bersatu and pass. And, and that's why you could see a sort of what they call a green wave, a green wave uh, that, that was very Islamist in nature, uh, that would won a lot of seats, uh, won up to what, 74 seats in parliament. Um, the second point was AMNO itself, being in the lead position, agitating for a general election, lost badly. They, they only won 36 seats. Um, and for a simple reason, they did not have money. Uh, they didn't raise enough money, which they usually do. They are usually cash rich. Uh, they didn't have the machinery, which has slowly dissipated in the last few elections. Um, you know, in, in GE uh, 14, in G 13, since 2008, when uh, Barisan National, uh, the, the coalition at Amno leads, uh, has been losing its majority and slowly losing its seats, right? So, so basically, um, People weren't investing in them. People weren't donating money to them. Uh, tycoons weren't giving them enough money. And of course, they tried a, a, a different way of raising funds. Uh, read uh, 1MDB scandal, uh, where Prime Minister Najib uh, found an alternative way of raising funds for the party. Um, so that didn't work. He's in jail for that. Uh, they don't have the machinery anymore because the machinery depends on money. And they don't have the money, therefore you don't have machinery. The, the other M, there's three M's here. The other M was they didn't have a mission. What was their mission? You know, I've, in all the years that they were government, we've always talked about development. But in all the shenanigans since 2018, uh, it was all more, all more about power and keeping power for themselves. Uh, and they were getting a lot more parochial in nature. They were, they were talking about Malay rights uh, and how the Malays were losing out. Uh, a narrative which, you know, someone like uh, the world's, Oldest Prime Minister Mahathir Muhammad still agitates once in a while. Uh, the third point is that, you know, since Anwar was sacked in, in uh, 1998 and jailed in 1999, his party, PKR itself, has always been uh, more an urban party. And, and in, in the 20 years that the party's been existing, since, since Anwar was sacked and jailed, uh, it has never expanded its footprint beyond the urban areas. Um, and I think there's been a bit of a, they've been a bit sloth about it. I mean, the fact that uh, one, uh, that Nurul Aziza, his daughter, lost the family fortress, so to speak, um, in the last election, proved that that they were just, uh, they were just, uh, how do I say, they were just uh, confident they could keep their things, right? They, they were nonchalant about, you know, keeping, making sure that they, they kept power and kept expanding their power. They didn't get to do that. Um, and, and it just showed that maybe they needed a kick up their collective uh, posterior uh, a lesson uh, to, to actually do better, or also to draft in new, uh, new candidates who would work the ground and get it for them. The, the, the last one I want to make was also the rise of Bonio parties in Saban Sarawak. Uh, 
these parties, as we've known, have always been uh, dominated. I'm sure James will have a lot to say about this uh, by uh, the chaps in the Malay Peninsula. Um, but you know, because of the pandemic, uh, and because of I think really steady, uh, how do I say this, uh, patriarchal leadership, especially in Sarawak, uh, and of course I'm mean infighting in Sabah, that, that, that the votes actually went to more local parties, more state-based parties than rather than the peninsula-based parties. Um, and it just tells you that uh, Malaysia, as we stand today, is ever more divided uh, politically. I mean, I think as, as, an, as a nation, as peoples of a nation, we are quite united being Malaysian. Uh, as you could see from the reception uh, for Michelle Yeoh when she won the Oscar. But as, a, as people, we are. But I think politically, and I think because politicians need to divide uh, to rule, to show that they're different from the other and they're better, you will have political divisions going in for the longest time uh, going forward in our country. And until one day, I think a new generation of Malaysians will say, no, no, hang on a minute, let's let's push this aside and let's really build a Malaysian narrative rather than a narrative based on race or region uh, and, and religion, so to speak. So that's that. Thanks. Thanks, Jahaba. I was trying to find a, a way to bring Michelle Yeoh into the conversations. Thank you for doing that uh, for, for me. And, and the point you made about Amno, sometimes people don't understand that not only did it had had leading up to 2018, had it won every election since independence in 1957, but it goes back to the colonial times when the first legislative assembly and councils were formed in, in the early 50s. The Alliance Party had won every election. So, so this is the last five, six years, you've seen really a seismic shift in, in, in politics in Malaysia. So, so James, maybe your reflections on, on, on that seismic shift and, and, and you know, particularly how it played out in November 2022. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll start off by thanking uh, AIA Western Australia for the kind invitation to hold this joint event. So I think very quickly, just to add on to what Jahaba has said, I'd like to make about uh, eight or nine points. I think the first point about this election is that the Malay quality, the so-called Malay voters were really split in these elections. So in 2018, you can see that the votes were split three ways, but in this election, it was essentially split only two ways. It was basically between uh, Perikatan National or AMNO. The second point I would like to make was that for a very long time, the NGOs in Malaysia or the CSO were agitating for what they call the U18 votes or the new voters. Put everybody, uh, make sure you have automatic registration. One of the interesting things was that the underlying assumption was that with young people, they tend to be more progressive. So they will vote for more progressive parties. But in fact, that didn't turn out to be true. The sort of figures- the point, James, for our viewers, so this is the first time that voting age was 18 in, in this election. Yes. And also automatic registration. Whoever is above 18 years old, your name will appear in the electoral roll, regardless of whether you sign up for it or not. So based on the figures I've seen, especially in the Malay heartland states, a lot of the 18, 19, 20 year old, or what we call the first time voters, they actually came out and when they came out to vote, they actually voted for Perikatan National. So that's the second point. The third point is something that both of you are alerted to, that this is the first time that the electoral system in Malaysia uh, were not able to return a clear winner. As you all know, right, one of the reasons why we have first passed the post system was that it's supposed to return a very clear winner. But in this case, uh, for the first time, no clear winners at all. And it was not even close. I mean, the magic number was 112, and the closest we got was just above 80. So it was not even close. Uh, the fourth point I'd like to make is that for the very first time in the last three or four elections, Sabah and Sarawak are no longer the kingmakers. In fact, the kingmaker this time turned out to be Amno, right? And the fifth is that uh, for the very first time as well in Malaysia's political history, uh, the royals had to come in to select the winner, so to speak. So they had to intervene directly. So I think that is a really, really important point because we're dealing with constitutional issues here. The sixth point I'd like to make is that I think after last November's election, it is now normal to have regime change. Prior to 2018, right, I was speaking to a lot of senior people in Kuala Lumpur. Everyone was saying that 
if there's a regime change, you don't know how the army is going to behave. You don't know how the civil service is going to behave. But now after three or four regime change, especially in 2018, 2020, 2021, and now 2022, nobody even talks about you know, a threat to the whole nation if there's a regime change. In fact, it is seen as normal. And yet this thing has happened only in the last five years. Um, the other point I want to make is that the gulf between, not only between the politics are, 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 are you know, huge, the gulf between Peninsular Malaysia politics and East Malaysia has gotten even wider. But the thing that really worries me is this very important point I need to raise, right? If you look at the Malaysian parliament now, right, the two biggest blocks is PAS and the second biggest block is DAP. And these two have nothing in common at all. There is no overlap. Right, one stands for overthrowing the current constitution, wanting to set up a theocratic state. The other stands for a liberal circular state. So there's nothing in common between two big, these two big blocks, and they are the largest blocks in parliament, basically accounting for about half of all the seats in parliament. And finally, the interesting point about this election was that the federal government or whoever is in the federal government, in this case Pakar Harapan, they will have a chance to retest you know, the theory about the green wave. Because uh, later on this year, we will see six state elections coming up. And out of these six state elections, three will be what they call the Malay heartland states. So we will know for sure whether there's, there was such a thing as a green wave that happened last November. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, I'll come back to those very interesting five days and, and as political tragics, I know we were stuck. You, I think you were you were in Malaysia at the time, James. Of course, Jahaba, you were there. I was stuck to the internet, um, trying to figure out all the moves and 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 the slaloming between one party and the other and individuals. Um, so so we made we've made the point. Hang Parliament. Anwar led Pakatan Harapan won the largest single bloc, as you said, not by much. Uh, his accession to Prime Minister on 24th November was a complicated and chaotic process, requiring him jumping into bed with some strange partners. I would like to unpack these five dramatic James, these five dramatic days. Maybe you can you can share, James. I'll start with you now. What chances did you give Anwar when you saw the results and the permutations and and, and the calibration required both from a policy and a numbers perspective to make that magic number. And you mentioned the role of the royals. Maybe, maybe if you can unpack that, James, and then your views after that, Jahaba. Yeah, I think if you look at the five days, you've got to divide the first 24 hours, the night the election results came out, and then two days after that. I think when the results came out, it was quite clear among a lot of people in Kuala Lumpur that uh, you know, that uh, Perikata National was in the lead because Perikata National was quite gung-ho. Uh, Muyadin thought that he can swing Amno behind him, but more importantly, he already had a phone call with uh, GPS, the ruling coalition in Sarawak, and they actually flew people over to say that they will join Perikatan. So I think it was quite gung-ho about it. Uh, but what happened with the palace was that the palace gave everybody at 2 o'clock the next day to formally submit a list. And I think what happened was that there was a lot of back and forth. And two days later, I think this is, of course, we will never know because the palace is not going to confirm any version of it. What I suspect happened and what, and what people tell me was that uh, basically there was sort of a meetings of individual political groups and political leaders with the Agong. And I think uh, there was some sort of conversation. I think the conversations, although the Agong did not tell them exactly how to go about the government, but I think there was, there was a lot of hint on both sides about which way the wind should be blowing. And I think on the, after the second day, I think it was quite clear uh, that the palace wanted a government that reflect the Malaysian reality, which is a multicultural uh, and a multi-religious society. I think one very important point is that if you look at Perikata National, right, even on election night, it was very clear uh, they had not a single Indian or, or Chinese MP elected. I think that bothered a lot of people, especially in the so-called Malaysian establishment. It was always understood that, you know, if you want political stability in Malaysia, every community or every major community has to be represented at a high table. 
Of course, I'm not saying that everyone has equal power, but everyone is represented at a high table. And I think that thing sort of bothered the Malaysian establishment. So my take is that, you know, at the end of the day, I think, uh, you know, there were hints given out that, you know, probably Anwar can pull together a better uh, government that reflects, you know, the, the, the diverse society Malaysia is. But again, like I said, we will never know the true story. But whatever deal that was done, the crucial deal was basically two things that happened that, that gave Anwar the, the numbers to form the government. Uh, that was the role played by Zahid. He really cobbled Amno together, even though he faced lots of opposition in Amno. He basically put his foot down, so to speak, even though he knew that, you know, uh, he still got corruption cases against him. He wanted to pull across uh, to Anwar. And secondly, the big thing that happened was that GPS had to retract the support for Perikatan National because the non-Muslim community in Sarawak put up a big fight. And basically, they told GPS that we cannot accept you supporting you know, an old Malay government, especially when it's quite clear that Perikatan National only represents uh, one segment of the population and does not reflect the true diversity of Malaysia. I want to unpick that a little bit. And I, I followed that story of the protests in Sarawak. So in your view, it played a role in, 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 in switching GPS, the, 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 pre, the premier party in Sarawak, to change its, its alliance. It was one of the major pressure points because uh, for the very first time, uh, the Anglican Bishop of Kuching came out with a very, very strong statement. And that was supported by the Catholic Bishop and he was also supported by all the churches in Sarawak. So I think that was, a, that was a really important thing because traditionally, the churches in Sabah and Sarawak tend to be non-political or they don't show their, their political hand. This time, they came out openly. Uh, they even issued a press release. Uh, that was very, very unusual. And that brought a lot of pressure on the GPS to at least, at the very least, re-evaluate They'll, they'll, they'll support for PN. But like I said, it is my understanding that, you know, they also received hints from the palace that maybe their first choice wasn't going to work out well. Thank you. Jahaba, over to you. And, and maybe I would like you to reflect as well, uh, and we can come back to it if there's interest in the, the Q&A with the audience, is, is the role of the palace. The Agong is the king in Malaysia. It's a, it's a rolling five-year term between nine traditional rulers of, uh, of states. Um, just for our audiences who are not so, our audience was not so um, up to up to date with, with the Malaysian constitutional systems. So the role of the, of the palace in in those five days, Jahaba, um, unusual, um, but important. How what does this say for the future as well? And if you want to reflect on that as well in in your in your in your on your comments. Yeah, def definitely. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, definitely, it's unusual. I mean, we are a constitutional monarchy. Um, usually, uh, there will be enough of a majority uh, for, for someone to submit to palace to the palace after elections that they would like to form the government. They have enough support in parliament to form the government. But as James pointed out, uh, this was the most hung up hung parliaments in Malaysia, um, and notwithstanding AMNO. Uh, by the skin of their teeth of Barisan National, having fewer than 40 seats uh, in Zaid's eyes would support uh, Anwar Ibrahim, but in the eyes of his uh, own MPs, newly elected MPs, they were more keen to swing towards Parikatan. So you had a situation where individual MPs were torn, but we, but they, they had to hold on to the fact that we had this new anti-hopping law. So they had to go as a block um, and I think the nine rulers, particularly the king, uh, reflected on this and decided to take charge of situation, which is really unprecedented in Malaysia. Um, you know, in the sense that after general election, the palace basically nudges everyone and says, I'd like this chap to be the prime minister. Never done before in Malaysia. Now, of course, uh, it was done in, in a slightly more oblique way in, in 2020 when, when Muhyiddin Yassin himself became uh, Prime Minister, because Mahathir Mohamad, Dr. Mahathir Mohamad had resigned. Um, and then subsequently, uh, Ismail Sabri took over from, um, from uh, Medin Yassin. Uh, those, those were very subtle ways of arranging who should be Prime Minister, but that was done uh, without an election. This is the first time in an election, after an election. I mean, imagine this, right? A country of X number of voters returned 222 MPs. 
Um, and yet it took the palace to tell them who the prime minister should be. Uh, I can't say that's really a democracy. Um, so, but we live in interesting times. And in many ways, I think more Malaysians uh, thank the palace uh, for their wisdom in choosing the government of the day. And, and as James has pointed out, a government that reflects Malaysia, um, the, the establishment, uh, the general population, uh, the peoples of the Borneo states and, and the Malay states, uh, Peninsula Malay states, um, a lot more representative than the other side, so to speak. Uh, but it, you know, it comes with it comes with an issue going forward. Uh, will we always see this? As James pointed out, uh, will, regime change is now a regular thing in Malaysia. But does this mean that every election we will look towards the palace? And it is, as you pointed out, it's a revolving uh, um, term, right? Every five years we get a new king. So are we then exposed to uh, the vagaries of who the king is and who his preferences are? Um, and so, so that's troubling. That is troubling for Malaysia. That's troubling for democracy, so to speak. And unless we fix our electoral system, uh, maybe no longer a first past the post, maybe uh, the other hybrid systems we can talk about. But this is actually troubling, uh, troubling to anyone who's a voter in Malaysia where one man has one vote. Now, of course, we've never had one man, one vote in Malaysia because of the gerrymandering. And, and uh, James also pointed out, you have two extreme blocks, uh, DAP, uh, with 40 over seats, um, a pass officially with 49 seats, but uh, 49 seats with X number of voters against the DAP health seats, which, which has, I think, maybe twice the number of voters. Uh, mm -hmm. Sharizan, who won in, um, where is this, in uh, Sardang, right? In uh, Sardang, he, he's uh, standing a constituency of 300,000 voters, right? And we have uh, seats which are so small. Uh, I think they're probably like one sixth of, of what Sardang is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we in 2026, in, in, in two years' time, in three years' time, we will be starting the redelination of our constituencies. Maybe there'll be a balance, I don't know. I think uh, James will be perfect to actually tell you that our constitution actually says one third of the seats should actually be outside the peninsula when Singapore was part of us. Um, and then I think it changed in 74, if I'm not mistaken. And now it's, it's, uh, there's some sort of guarantee quarter the seats are outside of the peninsula. Now, how does that help us? I don't know. But it, if you need a balance of seats, so then you can actually have a clearer outcome of elections. But yeah. what has happened in the, last, in the five days from 19 to the 24th when Anwar Ibrahim became Prime Minister is troubling because we had to rely on one man in the palace to basically say, please go this way. And I do not think any democracy should actually have that kind of uh, power given to one man. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 something new, another new element in Malaysian politics. You touched on the gerrymandering. It's you know I thought Malaysia was the world champion of gerrymandering, and then I discovered the U.S. electoral system. So I think Malaysia is still not the world champion. Like you know Malaysia has never won an Olympic gold medal, so it's still silver. Um, but um, the the issue with, with there's there's an Australian connection to that constitutional protection because in the original 1957 constitution there was protections of relative sizes as we do in the Australian constitution, uh, but that was uh, taken away in the 1960s uh, because in Malaysia you only need two thirds majority in in the lower house in parliament to be able to to change the constitution so that protection was also removed, leading to what we have today in that, that heavily gerrymandered um, uh, system that, that, that you have. But one positive, I think, both in the 2018 and the 2022 election, uh, I would see as an as a outsider, as an observer, is the performance of the Electoral Commission, um, uh, the SPC, uh, S, S, SP, I don't know the Malay acronym, I keep forgetting. Sulu SPR. SPR. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's that's a stamp of legitimacy that they've been able to establish through uh, various administrations, through the regime change. So I think I think uh, that that is that augurs well for the future of Malaysia's democracy from that perspective. I don't know whether you'd agree with me on that or not. Oh, yeah, I, relatively. I think uh, what we have is actually a very good set of people at uh, SPR. 
we've got uh, two people of note, uh, Zoe Randawa, who used to be from Bursay, and uh, Professor Azvi Sharum, uh, UM Law Lecturer. He's the Deputy Chairman of the SPR. I think without them in, in the Election Commission, uh, we would actually go back to Najib's last election in 2018, where we had uh, voting day, balloting day was on, on a midweek in Wednesday, on Wednesday, rather than the traditional Saturday. Uh, and I think we were fortunate now that we have established, I think at least nine days of uh, of campaigning rather than, you know, um, no, I think no, that was two weeks of campaigning rather than the <clears throat> the shortest, which is nine days. Yeah. Great. Um, moving on, um, and and James, I'll turn to you for this. Um, and again, I I I I hasten back to my my childhood when I was growing up and, and following politics from a, from a fairly young age, uh, I wouldn't have imagined that one day I would see AMNO and DAP in a governing coalition. I, if somebody told me that, I would have told you you were seriously under the influence. Um, for, for political scientists, so many of the, of the normal idioms could apply. Politics is the art of the possible. There are no permanent friends or enemies in politics, etc. cetera. Um, prior, to the deal being struck, would you have thought it possible, uh, James? I think for those people who've been watching Malaysian politics since 2018, uh, it was quite clear, especially at the state level, that the AMNO people suddenly found past being too difficult to deal with. Uh, I've been told many times by AMNO people that you know, on the surface, it looks like we have a lot in common, but at the grassroots level, we really have problems with the past people. Um, I think, the, the key to it is really uh, they found that the DAP were very businesslike. And for whatever reasons, they sort of caught on to that, especially in places like uh, uh, Pera. Uh, basically, the idea was that uh, they caught on to this idea that we don't have to agree anything. We just agree on a set of things that we want to do. We form the government, just do those things, but we do it the way you know each of us, whichever party represents, we do it through our own individual parties. There's good and bad things about that, that approach. But basically, I think, uh, basically, we are not, the thing that was driving them, including looking at dealing with DAP, is basically, I'm not understood that, you know, as Jahaba said in his opening remarks, the only reason I'm not can survive is because they have access to government resources. Without access to government resources, right, they cannot survive. And that was the lesson learned in 2018 when they lost power. Suddenly, all their best friends disappeared. You know, as, 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 as there's a saying that, you know, you only know who your real friends are <laughs> after you no longer hold the office. And I think that was exactly uh, what happened to Amno. They realized that the only game in town is to be part of a government. And so that's the reason why they were willing to compromise. And I think on the other side, it was true as well. Uh, for the DAP, after being in government for the very first time in 2018, uh, after losing government in 2020, they also realized that, you know, the only game in town is to be in government. We don't have to control the entire government, but we have only have to be part of the government so that we can do certain things for the people we represent. And I think that was the thing that pulled both of them together. Jahaba? Yeah, I think, I, you know, um, the, the premise for both Am AMNO and DAP is that they're not the other, right? Uh, AMNO is Malay, AMNO is about the king, Amno is about patriotism, uh, but Amno is caught up according to the DAP, right? So the DAP say, no, we are all about for every Malaysian, not just the Malays. Uh, we want a liberal, uh, e equitable future for every Malaysian, not descending their origins. So they've always played on that at every election they clash. But I mean, the reality is they don't actually stand against each other. You know, DAP is a more urban seats, Amno is more rural seats. Um, but so in many ways, going forward in, in the next uh, six state elections, um, they won't really be facing each other or giving each other seats. But what is troubling is that to, to their members who have been brought up to it, that the other side is the evil one. How do you reconcile cooperating or sitting uh, or sleeping in the same bed as, as the federal government? Um, which is why you can see that the top leaders of the DAP uh, are not in the federal government. Right, uh, it's more the younger set of members, a bit more amiable, who uh, don't, who have never put much stock in saying that we are not Amno, uh, like some Anthony Lok, uh, Hannah Yo, 
Um, no, they were always about uh, Najib Razak and 1MDB, but not essentially AMNO is evil. Um, and, and But for AMNO, because AMNO has so few uh, MPs, whoever is available is in the government. Uh, so they have to go back now to their voters in the state election and say, we can work together because. So there's, there, there needs to be a new narrative. But I agree with you. you know, anyone growing up in Malaysia I would say, this is impossible. I mean, if you go back, even dredging up the past of, of uh, the Slango elections in 1969, for example, uh, and, and why you had uh, emergency and all that. Uh, this is definitely uh, a seismic change in Malaysia, but it also tells you that, uh, uh, as James said, you know, out of the possible, uh, anything can happen, uh, and it has happened. Um, and so be prepared for more shocks along the way. Um, uh, but you know the, the one reality of this entire exercise is that uh, race-based parties now have very little uh, say and sway. You know the likes of MC and MIC mm -hmm. uh, are not; they, they, their future is very much in doubt. And mm -hmm. uh, and so this one point I'm bringing up is because in in the outside when you said um, the government did not have any non-Malays, they didn't have Indians and Chinese. James and you mentioned this. Um, actually, the MC and MIC chaps in the in the five days <laughs> had wanted to be with Parikatan, yeah. right? But because Zaid won by the skin of his teeth, he said no. You know, I so, so if you ever go back to the, that five days or even November 18 and 19, why Amno lost so badly, at the end of it, Amno itself was at cross purposes. There were people sabotaging each other. And I think the main point of that night, November 19th night, was they wanted Zahid to lose. Because if he had lost, you and I won't be here talking about Anwar Ibrahim as Prime Minister today. None three of us won't be here at all. We will be, mm -hmm. we'll have uh, Tan Sri Medin Yassin as in Putrajaya rather than facing seven court charges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, well made point. Um, so Anwar, Led, the Anwar-led administration has 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 just passed a few a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's hundred days in power. Um, James, if you were marking this student uh, as a professor and giving them a progress report, what would it be? I think all fairness, I'll probably give them a B. Uh, they won't get an A. Uh, I'll give them B for the following reasons. I think uh, there's several things that came out that is very positive. One was the budget that came out. I think a lot of people thought that Anwar will go for election budget because of the six elections coming out. He didn't really uh, do that. Although uh, there were some elements like a lot of the direct cash benefits to the, uh, the bottom 20, which is basically the poor Malays. But basically there were no shiny, big shiny projects in, in, in the budget. And I think that was really important. It sort of calmed the international markets. Secondly, I think what was positive is that Anwar is very well known internationally. So I think the international community had a very positive outlook for Malaysia because as you know, they had a very negative outlook with, with Najib and, and, and the thing. Um, I think what was also positive was that they did rush through several bills. So for example, um, you know, even though uh, they didn't originate it, but they did push through the bill to give uh, citizenship uh, to children uh, uh, born to Malaysian mothers. Malaysia is very conservative. It is not the only Commonwealth country, but they inherited a law where it says that only if your father is a Malaysian, the children will get the citizenships. So they did push over there. But I thought the really important one was that uh, they pushed through the bill, uh, which granted Sabah and Sarawak status in that it mentioned the Malaysia agreement. This is a long standing thing. They pushed that through. And the next bill, my understanding, they're going to try to push through, and that's really, really important as well, is that they're going to uh, uh, remove uh, absolute uh, power to the AG's position. They're going to split it two. That will be a, a real game changer in the judiciary. So for those reasons, I will say that uh, they've done quite well uh, to get a B grade. But of course, they've done some major political mistakes. Uh, one is, of course, Anwar should not have appointed the daughter as an advisor to the, to the finance minister. Uh, I think uh, that was handled very poorly. And also, I think some of the ministers in the current government are underperforming. Uh, but having said that, you have to remember, this is a government, uh, you know, that's only been in power for only 100 days. 
uh, by and large in terms of the, the image thing, as you know, in, in the 21st century government is about images and everything. I think by and large, he has not made any, any major mistakes. So uh, it's a question of uh, 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 how will he carry on uh, forward in this? My understanding is that the entire government machinery is sort of on hold because everyone is waiting for the results of this upcoming six state elections. So this six state elections is really crucial to the question we asked in this seminar, whether Arnold will hang around <laughs> to the end of the year or will he disappear at the end of the year? Everything hinges on the upcoming six state elections. And I think Jahaba may have something to say about that as well. Just, just a couple of points um, to, to follow up questions. Can you explain a bit the, this AG, um, a change in the AG's role? Uh, and, and also, can you remind our audiences when the state elections uh, are being held? Right. So in terms of the AG, uh, Malaysia has not inherited the Westminster system. So the way it was in Malaysia is that the AG has become a very politicized position. So the thing about the AG, the thing that people are really bothered is that the AG has absolute discretion on any sort of cases, whether he wants to prosecute or not. Yeah. yeah, whether he wants to prosecute or even if he wants to drop it. Yeah. So that's the reason why a lot of people said that if you have the government, your cases will sort of disappear, slow down, whatever. So the idea is that too much power is held by one person and that person... Uh, officially, it's a non-political person, but in practice, it's a, it's a highly politicized post. So most people feel that uh, you can't have, uh, you know, a, a sort of a, a government going forward in, in, in this position. So it's crucial they they split the position up. The idea is that you give prosecution power to another person. So I think that's that's really important. Now, in terms of the state elections, basically what happened was that uh, the Malaysian system requires both the state and the federal government to hold elections every five years. So because the elections were held last year before the five years is up, these six states that were elected in 2018, they need to hold their elections this year. The unique thing about these six states is that two of these six states are so-called the most urbanized and the richest state in Malaysia, Selangor and Penang, which is also where the bulk of the non-Malays live, but also three of the what they call the Malay heartland states, Kedah, Trenganu and Kelantan. And the reason why it's very important is something I mentioned in my opening remarks, that the so-called green wave happened in these so-called Malay heartland states. Because traditionally, it was always understood that past political power was locked into the four heartland states in the north. They were not able to break out. So people are saying, is this breakout real? Or people supported past because they hate Amno. They want to get rid of Zahid and Najib. So we will know the answer when this six-state election comes out. As to the timing, although they haven't officially announced the results yet, uh, it is almost certain to be held after High Raya, where everyone is happy. And uh, the sort of dates that people are talking about now, you can't hold me to it, but people are just saying it, it's either July or August. Thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and Jahaba, I know you have reported from close distances political transitions in the region, notably in Indonesia. I think, I think we were both in Jakarta during the Saharto transition if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And so you, you've seen this political transitions take place. How has Hanwa and his coalition partners managed it? Especially given that the 2018, the two years, around about two years, the 18 months they were in power and now this time around. Well, I think, I think there's a huge difference really. Uh, I, I, I would like to call the 2018 government's uh, PH1, mm. the 2022 government's PH2. Uh, and the difference is because most of the personalities in this current government were not in, in the Mahate government. Uh, so they have different ways of, of, of working or engaging or problem solving. And also you have to remember that the current government is actually a coalition government that is beyond PH, that's beyond Anwar's uh, coterie of, of uh, parties. Uh, it involves uh, the Sarawak parties who were so much against him previously. Uh, when he when he kept saying that he had the numbers, right? I mean, remember when he said he had strong, formidable, convincing numbers, and that became a sort of a joke. Um, but yeah, so you have a government where he he has put in people, or he has, he's been asked to name people that he was never comfortable with, who are also not comfortable with him. Um, so I, I agree with James that yeah, you know, B B is this just means yeah, well, you know, you just sort of passed it. Um, 
I mean, they're lacking in, in some policy issues. I, I think the first 100 days should be a lot more on policies, but policies will be slow because of the state, six state elections. Uh, they don't want to alarm people. Uh, you can also see that they didn't do, unlike Dr. Mahate, they didn't uh, change around a lot of civil servants. The chief secretary government is still the same chap. The IGP is still the same chap. The anti-corruption guy is the same chap. The attorney general is the same chap. He has not sacked anyone. He has not shamed anyone. Uh, it's a bit of a charm offensive. So, so I think the first 100 days was about letting people be comfortable with him. I mean, this is a guy who has been wanting to be prime minister for a long time and got it after almost 25 years of being in the wilderness, right? So I'm sure he'll take it very slowly, very in a very measured ways. Um, so I, I think we only know more what this government is all about after the six state elections. So we are still in, in a holding pattern. Um, we, we, they still have made mistakes, as, as James pointed out, appointing Nurul Iza uh, to an advisory post. And I get it. I, I get why he did that. I, I, because I think this time around, really, he has very few people he can trust. Mm. Uh, I think you can see from, from the groups that he has, the people that has put in place, these are the people he trusted from 30 years ago. Not some of the younger advisors who came along when he was in jail, out of jail. Um, I mean, Anwar is known for um, changing his circle of advisors every five, six years. But he's putting in people that he can really trust from a long, long time ago. Um, so it will be slow and he will make mistakes. Uh, and more so if he appoints family members or anyone else like that. Uh, I, I think uh, we hold him to a higher standard. We hold Anwar to a higher standard because we think he's a reformist, because he's been saying he's a reformist. He only became a reformist when he was sacked in 1998. I, I mean, so we, we're talking about, and, and the reform uh, label, you know, came because of Indonesia, yeah. right? When you're there yeah. during the, the change, right? The KKN, corruption, uh, chronism, uh, and nepotism, right? So, so this reformacy cry started in, in, in Indonesia. You know, we adopted it. He adapted it. Uh, so I, I think he's, when people say he's a reformist or has reformist credentials, I will say I have a long memory. I, I was a junior, I was a cadet journalist at the time. Um, and I can still remember things. Uh, so no, I said that the jury is still out on reforms, but I think he'll do it slowly. He has to. What has happened in the time he has been in jail and out of uh, in the wilderness is we actually, uh, and this is something we haven't never discussed, we discussed the royalty just now, is the, the role of the civil service. The civil service is a law unto itself, right? They, no, notwithstanding all the governments that came in the last four or five years, the civil service has remained largely intact with the same kind of mindset, uh, and which is why uh, some people are saying, alluding that uh, there's a bit of a pushback by silly things like dress codes and such, right? So when we talk about a lousy government sometimes and when we talk about how things can be solved some of those problems and solutions are actually at the civil service level not at the political level but we can't tell the difference because we are so used to making everything political in malaysia mm -hmm. so it's something for us to ponder that maybe some of the things uh, the mistakes made particularly in implementation of policies is because the civil service is loath to do it or they don't see it as an advantage to them um, and this has happened during the time when Najib was in prime minister, uh, was prime minister, when he set up his uh, pomandu, uh, his outside unit, his uh, uh, blue ocean strategy. He did all that because he knew the civil service uh, wouldn't condone what he did, right? Uh, and I, I think so. That's one issue. I think for further talks, we really have to talk about the Malaysian civil service. I, I think they have been more an impediment. Than, than um and an encourager of 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 uh, good things going forward for Malaysia. I, I think you made a very a good point. I mean, in in the material I'm seeing, uh, as you as you refer to the charm offensive, I'm there's so much material out there of you know, uh, Anwar at the public service at the gatherings, uh, you know, dynamic speakers like himself, like some of his like some of his ministers, like Hannah Yo sort of you know were, you know praising the public service 
encouraging them to be, you know, for want of a better word, you know, uh, policy entrepreneurs and, and the like. So, and, you know, maybe that's a strategy that he's, he and his team are trying to employ is to, to shore up the support of the public service, empower them, um, and, and try and make it appear as if he's working into their, to their best interests. Definitely. Um, so you, we've started the crystal ball um, uh, exercise, but I want to, to sort of formally start it now. Um, you know, we have seen how strange this co coalition appears to be. Um, you know, we've 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 talked around the issue of this magic number of one one two, two. if I'm mistaken, one one two, um, that he needs uh, to maintain his majority in parliament um you've you've mentioned uh, both of you have mentioned the state elections um i want to i guess look at other issues that could impact on a split uh in in the coalition um and i want to turn back to to the dap i guess james um it it appears to be playing a very different role this time around. Um, I think uh, Jahaba, you alluded to it. Uh, you saw a very brash DAP in 2018, um, you know, making, you know, some could even argue arrogant. Uh, they seem to have learned from that lesson, not just personnel, but their posture and the tone that they're taking. It appears to be quite different. How do you see it, James? I think I would agree with you totally that the DAP that we see today is uh, very different. And I think a lot of the credit has to be given to the new uh, DAP uh, Secretary General, Anthony Locke. I think Anthony Locke has a much wider appeal in the Malay uh, community compared to uh, Lim Guang Eng. I think what you saw in the DAP and uh, Anthony Locke has gone on record, he gave a very important media interview and he said very clearly that, you know, after the elections, we made it very clear to Anwar that you know, we will give him completely free hand in terms of putting the government together. Free hand, including uh, who he wants to appoint the cabinet, how many positions he wants to give to DAP. We're not going to demand anything. All we want is an Anwar-led government. So because of that, I think the DAP has made a deliberate uh, 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 decision to keep a very low profile because they understood clearly one of the reasons that the 2020 Pakata Harapan 1.0 government fell was because uh, AMNO and PAS uh, started a very, very successful campaign at that time. The narrative was that the Malays and uh, Islam was being sidelined and they blamed the DAP primarily for that situation. So that was also the reason why you can see very clearly that this time uh, Anwar did not appoint uh, DAP or any other party to hold the Minister of Finance post. He mm -hmm. held it himself. And in fact, the second post, uh, Minister of Economic Affairs, he also gave it to his own party. So you can see that, you know, uh, he was quite clear about the way he structured the thing. Uh, the DAP basically got positions that were regarded as uh, not, not, not to say not political, but uh, less politically risky, things like transport. So when you talk about transport in Malaysia, right, uh, the thing that comes to people's mind is all about the delays with Asia, difficulty in getting money back. Secondly, it's the breakdown in the LRT, the mini rail system in Kuala Lumpur. This is their idea of Ministry of Transport among, among Malaysians. And the other one is Hana Yo, you know, dealing with women's issues, uh, children's issues, that sort of thing. So these are so-called less uh, risky political posts that was given to the DAP. So I think the DAP has made the right decision in keeping a low profile now. I think they understand that uh, now the key to stabilities with Anwar's government is that, you know, uh, their coalition with AMNO has to do very well in this upcoming six state elections. And that if the DAP is going to deliver anything to the non-Malay community, it will be over the long run. I think people keep forgetting that one of the reasons why the DAP was successful in Penang, right, over the last 15 years or more, was that most of the reforms only came after, after the first term, in other words, from the fifth year onwards. And I think the DAP has brought that lesson uh, to the national level. That's good. And, and Jahaba, we've seen ructions in AMNO. Um, uh, and do, do you think, uh, leaving the, the six state elections aside, although we know that's going to be very influential, um, do you think 
AMNO will continue to support ANWA um, um, in, in, you know, assuming that the elections go fairly well in, in, in the states? Yeah, I think they will. I mean, I, you know, one, uh, one thing that's happening this weekend is the AMNO elections. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because the first, the top two spots have been, have been blocked, uh, there's no, no contest rule. Uh, so the major focus will be on the vice presidency and, and of course, the, the other uh, positions in the party, the powerful Supreme Council. Um, Zahid's team has got uh, the youth chief post. They've got the women's uh, chief post. And now the attention is whether his, his uh, group will or his faction will win the three very strong vice, presidents, vice, vice presidency uh, seats. Uh, this Saturday, so I think I think if he can keep uh, control of his party for the next three years, that the Anwar government can withstand its full term, its full mandate. Um, but having said that, because he's still president for the next three years, he can still keep that together. Um, so you know, notwithstanding what happens at the state elections, um, that this government can last. Uh, but what's interesting is how the state elections go will actually uh, inform us, the general public, the analysts, the critics, uh, the soothsayers, the crystal ball gazers, as to how stable uh, AMNO will be um, in, going forward. Uh, because if they, are, if they continue to weaken at the state level, and if PKR can't break out of their urban seats, um, then you're going to see this so-called green wave uh, being stronger in, in the rich states of, of uh, Penang and Selangor. And I, I, I like to point this out. Uh, Penang wanted to have their state elections on November 19th, but Anwa at a, at a central level said no. They, they agreed no, they will have it later because they, weren't, uh, they didn't want to uh, di get distracted with state elections. And this is why the, the state of Negeri Sembilan too hasn't had an election. Uh, and Selangor. These are the three so-called Pakatan states. But there's a danger in Penang now because it's a 40-seat state legislature. Uh, 19 seats on the island um, contested by the DAP. Uh, as James sort of, I wouldn't say a lavish praise of the DAP, but he did say that they did a good job in, in Penang. Uh, they have done quite well. But there's 21 seats, state seats, uh, which are contested by PKR and Amanah, the 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 Malay partners in in uh, in Pakatan, uh, their seats are in danger, particularly on the mainland, and because yes, yeah, someone like Nurul Isa can lose mm -hmm. a federal seat on the mainland. Those twenty one seats are in danger, in serious danger of being lost. You know, mm -hmm. because all you need is twenty one state seats in in Penang Island in Penang State to form the government, mm -hmm. right? So there is a danger. There is a danger not just for AMNO, but there's a danger that Pakatan Harapan itself could face some losses unless they take the lessons of, of November 19 and start shoring up their machinery and getting, uh, I think, a better, a younger set of candidates who are, who are hungrier to, to stand for elections. So that, there's a danger there. This is not for AMNO, but I think for all the parties, uh, there is a huge danger for them. Um, on the flip side, Perikatan itself <clears throat> will have issues because Tan Sri Muhyiddin has been, has been slapped with seven charges. There are a few more cases, uh, charges coming up. And I think the one lesson we can see from all this is that they can't flash the kind of money they flashed during the 15 general elections. They flash a lot of money. They flash a lot of flags. Uh, James and I, I had the opportunity to, to take James around for one, one campaign which was DAP, which was fine. But I mean, I think he went around to a lot of places and he himself sort of assessed the, this money quotient that, that could sway the electorate to go the other way. So that's that's something to watch out for too, uh, come July. Yeah. Great. Um, we'll come back to domestic politics in the Q&A, but I have to put one question on foreign policy because of you know our institute's focus on that. And it's also a very interesting one. Uh, we have seen in foreign policy, Anwar take, as we would have expected, given his internationalist mindset and quite amazing network of friends, which has already been alluded to in high places around the world, he's taken a forward-leaning role. 
he was in the Philippines recently and he quoted uh, Jose Rizal as part of a pitch for ASEAN to do more in Myanmar. Uh, I quote him saying, in all honesty, I believe that non-interference is, not, is not a license for indifference. Um, that This must be one of the highest profile challenges to one of the sacrosanct principles of ASEAN by a member head of government in my, in my memory. James, how adventurous do you think Anwar is going to be? Or is he going to be allowed to be um, in, in, as, as, he, as he handles foreign policy? So I think foreign policy uh, will not be his key priority, at least for the next two years. But I think he will take certain positions which uh, will sort of uh, reinforce his brand as what they call the... Uh, Muslim Democrat. I think he's trying to uh, uh, enhance that brand as a Muslim Democrat. I think he does see himself at the end of the day as sort of the intellectual person who can merge uh, democracy, Western-style liberal democracy with political Islam. Because as you know, right, one of the major things about the West is that a lot of people have argued that uh, these two are incompatible. So he's one of those people who have uh, been saying for the last 20 years, uh, ever since the Asian Renaissance, that these two are compatible and you can sort of uh, uh, merge these two. So he will take certain key positions. So when I talk about that sort of thing, I'm talking about he will organize some very high profile uh, conferences. Uh, you can already see the people who are involved in this sort of uh, this Islamic uh, way of thinking about how international relations work. Some of these people left Malaysia when he was in prison. Uh, my understanding is some of these people have suddenly popped out in Kuala Lumpur and they're talking about organizing conferences again. So I think he will, uh, you know, have some platforms. Uh, I think he will work together with uh, like-minded leaders trying to project a sort of a more positive image of Islam. And I think uh, we can see that he'll be working closely with people like uh, Aragon in Turkey, who he's very close to, and maybe some of the more progressive groups in Indonesia, who he's also very close to. So I think that part he will he will do, but I think for the next two years, I think uh, domestic uh, thing will, will will be his his priority rather than than uh, um, um, foreign policy. It's interesting that you mentioned the case of uh, Mama. I think for the Malaysian side, uh, my take is that uh, Malaysia has been talking about Mama even under uh, under the the former regime Ismail Sabri and 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 uh, and. Uh, and the Muyadin, they also talk about that we need to do more. Part of it is because of the Rohingya thing, the Muslim solidarity thing. But I think it's, it's, it's widely understood in ASEAN circles that uh, Mama is a too hard basket. And I think the key to ASEAN, I mean, in terms of ASEAN thing, my take is that ASEAN is really a house divided now. And the reason why it's a house divided is all due to this uh, great power rivalry between the West and China over South China Sea and the rise of, of, of China. So I think uh, uh, that is a topic that I don't think Anwar will touch. And that topic is, of course, linked to what is happening in Myanmar because it's part of the what they call the great powers game. But I think on the Islamic platform thing about putting a more positive image of political Islam, I think that he would do, but it is not his priority. Okay. And you alluded to Indonesia, Jahaba. Uh, one country where he has particular resonance is Indonesia. I watched his public address during his recent visit to Jakarta. I mean, the love in the room was quite palpable. Um, and there were, there were people eating off his, his words. Are we going to finally see the, the two Nagara Sarumpun from the same roots bring their diplomatic weight together? Is that an opportunity for, for Indonesia and Malaysia to, uh, to work together in a way that uh, they haven't in the past? I think that definitely for sure. I, I, I think you know Indonesia has always been the, always assumed to be the big brother, and, and when Anwar was sacked, a lot of his uh, supporters had to flee to Indonesia. There are very deep, deep relationships there. Um, as as you said, uh, you know uh, he can go, he can walk on water in Indonesia. That's as, that's that's really is what he is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I think both between him and Jokowi, we'll we'll put some pressure on on ASEAN regarding Burma. But uh, uh, for them, for both to get together, uh, there will be a lot of possibilities uh, for future cooperation. I think they're going to get together on palm oil, on, on, on a host of issues. Uh, Malaysia will see benefit in 
in exporting uh, whatever engineers who are, which are, which are left uh, who are left in Malaysia to work on infra uh, projects in Indonesia. Um, already, actually, there are some issues because Indonesia itself is on an expansion uh, in Nusantara. We are losing a lot of, or well, we can't attract their their workers to come to Malaysia. Um, so I think then we'll have more investments in Indonesia uh, going forward. Um, and this is something which uh, the trade minister, the economics minister will have to have a look at. If you see Anwar, Anwar has always made it, he, he is, he's more, uh, I would say, a more uh, Nusantara kind of guy than, say, a reformist in that sense. Mm -hmm. So I think he will definitely work together in Indonesia on a host of issues. Um, and in a way, sort of a pincer movement for Singapore to, to, to consider. Um, we might see a revival, and, and this was Anwar's push when he was the deputy prime minister, of the IMT, GT, the growth triangles will start again. Uh, you remember from, from the 90s when he was sacked, um, both at the Borneo side and, and at the southern side with Bintan, Riau Islands. So you're going to see a revival, a lot of those uh, projects coming up. And more so, I think one, so as to give a sort of uh, vision and hope to Malaysians, uh, in many ways, uh, to my mind, it's actually a Mahate roadmap, which he is finally going to execute better than, say, anyone else had done. Because when, when he was sacked, this was the big thing. This was the, this, this was the main thing that was going on. You know, we had, we had uh, airlines that were servicing southern Philippines. And we ha you have to remember, Philippines is very important to Anwar too. Uh, southern Philippines with uh, Sabah and Sarawak. So I think all this will just make, it, we will have more emphasis in ASEAN. I think uh, since the time of Najib, um, post uh, Abdullah Badawi, and, and all the premises since then, they sort of neglected ASEAN and the Malaysian voice wasn't, wasn't truly uh, heard in at the ASEAN corridors. Um, and also again, with, with say neighboring states like Australia. Um, but now I think in the sense that because he, he, there I say, it, he has a, sort of an arrested development. He left at his prime when, when all these things were the buzzwords, right? With Australia, yeah. uh, education, and trade, and all that. So I think there are a lot of opportunities there at, at the regional and international level. Because Anwar, uh, as James has put it, is, is a Muslim Democrat. And, and you know, he was once voted uh, what uh, world's best finance minister, which, you know, you can take with a whole sack of stuff. So, but there you go. I'm not. I'm not a great fan of Anwar. I, I think he's he's okay for what he does, and I think at his, at this late stage of his life, he he has a lot to fulfill in in the next uh, four years than ever before. Yeah. Great. I'm I'm going to take some uh, audience questions now. The first one, and it came into very it's a very good question. It came it came on the record very quickly. It's from a anonymous attendee. Um, I'll read it out. There is a concerning trend witnessed in the general election, recent general election, GE15, where the Malay middle ground has moved further towards the right by voting for PAS mainly and Bersatu, secondly. While many of these were protest votes, the questioner asserts against Amno and Zahid. In the medium to long term, do you think this trend will continue to the point of being irreversible? I'll go to you, James. Is it irre irreversible, the green wave? Yes, I think he's talking about the rise of political Islam. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the answer is yes, it is uh, irreversible. So you can see this very clearly among the young people. And the reason for this is very clear, is due to the education system we have in Malaysia. And secondly, uh, the growth of the private uh, Islamic schools in Malaysia. So because of these two main factors, combined with sort of a government, direct, indirect uh, 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 coercion through a government department called JAKIM. So all this means that uh, it is uh, irreversible. Uh, I think the best that we can, the worst case scenario is that Malaysia will end up something like Pakistan, where on the surface you have a modern political system. If you scratch the surface, it's all based on tribal, Islamic, and all that sort of thing. That will be the worst case scenario. Uh, the best scenario for Malaysia will probably be uh, something closer to Indonesia, where there is an Islamic bloc, but that Islamic bloc can never capture power on its own. Jahaba? Yeah, I, I think I have to agree with, with James to a certain extent. Uh, because when you talk, uh, the question is, is very specific. You're talking about the 
the Malays, right? Uh, of course, Malaysia is much more than the Malays. Unfortunately, 70% uh, of the of population is officially Bumutra, of which about 55, 60% are Malays. Um, and and there, are, there are two groups of Malays. Uh, James was focusing on the younger set of Malays because of education. But there's also um, the older Malays. These were the ones who were educated, uh, who was uh, educated in the 70s and 80s. Uh, they, you know, they sowed their wild oats everywhere. Uh, some came back with, with uh, Caucasian wives and, and, and husbands. Uh, but so as they go on in life, as they get older, um, they, they, they'll be inward looking. Uh, they are the ones who are sponsoring these religious schools. Uh, they get a bit more religious because in the words of Daim Zainuddin, whom I had the opportunity of talking to uh, middle of last year about all this, he said, you know, Malays, when they get older, they, they look towards God. They look towards death and they want, they want a better afterlife. So for, for, for them, this kind of mindset will just mean, will suggest it'll be pass, it'll be Bersatu, it'll be a Malay nationalist Islamic uh, group, uh, very similar to Pakistan. So we will see this until, until un, I mean, until these guys die off, probably around the same time I, I expire too. But you, you, you will see this trend going on for a while. May I ask uh, Daim Zainuddin, uh, how long would this would last? And he said, at least 10 years, at least two to three election cycles. We just went through one. So maybe another a decade from now, we will see a change. Uh, but he said, look, this is only natural because of the environment that we are in and, and what, we, what the country has encouraged from the 70s and 80s mm. and 90s. We are reaping what we saw, you know, this focus on Islam, Islamic education, setting up a national Islamic uh, department. Uh, people intrinsically uh, link the fact, oh, I'm Muslim, I'm not corrupt, you know, I pray five times a day. But as you can see, um, and we didn't discuss this, all the guys who went to court in the last two weeks, and this is one of the questions being asked, uh, are all Malay Muslims, right? These are the chaps from, from uh, Bersatu. They were in government. They are Malay Muslims. They, they, were, they were charged with corruption, and, and they were charged with soliciting money from uh, Chinese businessmen and all that. Um, uh, Najib Razak is a Malay. He was charged with, with money laundering and all that. Uh, Zaid Hamidi, all of them. Um, so so it is a, it's a very interesting conundrum we're in. The, the Malays, the, the, the electorate believe they're, going, they're electing clean, uh, pious leaders. But these are the guys who are in court now. So whether they'll be turned off, I don't know. Um, and, and I think that the second question is a good segue to continue a little bit in, to dig deeper. And, and, in, and the question goes about the role of young Malaysians and what role they will take in Malaysian politics and decision making. So I'll turn that around and, and link it to the first question. Is it so, Jahaba, you're, you're suggesting that there could be some factors that this cycle could, could ride itself out uh, with maybe the, the, the younger generation notwithstanding a block of them have been, for want of a better word, been in this bubble of, of religious schools and whatnot, uh, maybe with the influence, and, and Malaysia is a very connected country on the internet. Still, I, I, I go back there and, and you know, um, the level of English, notwithstanding, you know, people of my father's generation sort of complaining about it, I'm always surprised at the literacy and the, the, the connection to the world that even some of the religious uh, people have. Do you think there's a chance that 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 after these cycles that that you could have a more centrist outcome, for want of a better word? I'm I'm not optimistic because uh, in relation to what you just said, we we just the, the government just announced a clearer set of rules for entertainment, uh, for for concerts and all. They've expanded the number of days you can have concerts, uh, and and all kinds of concerts. But they've also said. Okay, you can't have cross dresses. You can't. Every script has to be approved. You are filming a movie in Malaysia, so to my mind, that is the politicians whom we consider liberal, pandering to the civil service or interest groups in in the country. But that also just tells you that the that Malaysia today is a, a set of many Malaysians, uh, the urban Malaysians, uh, whether they are Malay, Chinese, Indians who study 
together in private schools and are very cosmopolitan in their outlook, very internationalist, and, and a bit, uh, for want of a better word, very liberal with how things are. But you also have a growing number of Malaysians uh, outside the urban areas who might have some resentment um, because they feel they're entitled, because they are sons of the soil. Um, unlike their parents who are poor farmers and who toil the land or caught fish in the sea, uh, these guys are just playing with their handphones the entire day. And with the rise of social media apps and such, they are being influenced by religious nutters, so to speak, the likes of Zakir Naik and all. Um, they spend the whole day just imbibing this. And, and you know, this is just not unique to Malaysia. You've mm -hmm. seen this in America. Uh, it happened in, in New Zealand, right? Mm -hmm. they, they're listening to or following conspiracy theories, QAnon and all that. So this is not just an Islamic thing. This is a yeah. global phenomenon, especially among the youth. So when you say, what's the role of the young? I, I can't say because the what influences the young today isn't like when you and I were much younger, not when we were, we were in 17 or 18, if you were a Penangite or what, you'd listen to the RAF radio from Batubas, right? So so you if you grew up there, you would listen to Elvis Presley, you listen to, to a lot of punk bands because you could tune into that station. But today, if you were in Malaysia, you don't know what your child is watching or listening to because they all have a handphone. They all yeah. have a data plan. You can't say what, you, you, you won't know what they're going through, right? So, and, and the Muslims themselves are worried because, hey, hang, some of them are becoming Shiite Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. We can't have that too. So mm -hmm. the young mind is fertile for any kind of indoctrination. Uh, and it's uh, something which no one has studied, uh, no one has seen. What we know is this, this is happening more among the Malay youth than the, theme, than the, the girls because I think 70% of undergrads in Malaysia are women. So they're more stable and, and they're a bit, uh, I would say, easier to, a bit, a bit more stable in the outlook of, of, of politics too. Um, and so that's a pushback, especially during Women's Day and all that. But the young males, they're the ones. They are the ones that are so part of the so-called Green Wave. They're the ones who voted because of the, the change in law where automatic registration, including getting to vote at the age of 18, meant that anyone who was lazy to even register now was a voter. And some of them were paid, they went to vote. And, and that's why we have a fair number of so-called Green Wave MPs in our country. I can't say the young are the future. I, I don't know, because it depends who's influencing them. And none of us have done enough study or gone, gone to all these remote areas to see what moves them. <laughs> Is it religion? Is it punk rock? I don't know. I have no idea. James, can you be a bit more optimistic? Oh, I'm very optimistic. <laughs> 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 let, let me just bring into another angle about what Yahaba and I have just said about the rise of political Islam in Peninsula Malaysia. I think there's another picture brewing, and that picture is brewing in East Malaysia, in Sabah and Sarawak. I think the picture over there is sort of completely different. I'll just start off with Sabah. I think what you have in Sabah is that increasingly you see the rise of Sabah nationalism and the Sabahan politicians are looking towards Sarawak. And this way, the Sarawak picture is a really interesting picture. So I think for the last 10 to 15 years, the Sarawakians basically don't like what is happening among the political class or politics in Peninsula Malaysia. So they have decided among themselves, among the political elites in Sarawak, sort of to close the borders in Sarawak. So they're trying to build a state within a state. So that's the reason why if you go to Sarawak today, right, Sarawak is the only state that allows people to hold demonstration to ask for independence, complete autonomy, all that sort of thing. And the incredible thing is that the last time they held a demonstration asking for independence, uh, they did it in Central Padang, which is just opposite the police station. Now, I can guarantee you, if you were to hold such a demonstration in any other state in Malaysia, you immediately be arrested for sedition. So you can see that the Sarawakians are very, very specific about building a state within a state. And you can also see this by the fact that the Sarawakians have played this card so successfully that no West Malaysian party other than the DAP has been able to create a foothold in Sarawak politics. 
even for the DAP, I would argue that it's due to local factors rather than federal factors that would account for DAP having a foothold in Sarawak. So that's what the Sabahans are trying to do as well. They're trying to build a Sabah for Sabahans and the Sarawakians are well on the way in terms of building a Sarawak for Sarawakians. So I think it's really interesting. As I mentioned earlier, we have a really interesting vision for Malaysia. The sort of Malaysian polity is divided into three separate visions. The first vision is the past vision, the biggest plot in parliament. They want a more theocratic, uh, more Malay state, uh, what I call Ketuana Melayu Islam state. Then you have the DAP state who want Malaysia to be modern, circular, uh, liberal. And then you have the East Malaysians who are saying that you guys on the peninsula have lost the plot. You know, you're <laughs> spending too much time playing with Islam as, as, as a government thing, right? So we want to do our own thing. We want to look back at the time when we had our own unique history. Uh, you know, we were conned by the British to join this thing called Malaysia. You promised us autonomy. In fact, you didn't give us autonomy. Now is the time now that you're weak over there. You're completely politically divided. We want to raise this issue of Malaysia agreement and we want to tap back political power to do our own thing. So there's sort of a sort of a, you know, this type of three visions happening in Malaysia at the same time. And for me, right, on the one hand, it's really good because I believe in a plural political system. On the other hand, knowing the Malaysian political system quite well, I can also argue this is also quite a dangerous trend. So really, uh, we really need Anwar to use all his uh, political talent, so to speak, to pull everybody together. But I'm sure Johaba will agree with me. Unfortunately, we don't know what is his vision for Malaysia until after the state elections. Thank you. Um, one, there was a third question, and I think it's a good one to, to focus on because it's very, very kind of hot off the news. Um, how likely is, and it comes from Christian Wells uh, from our audience, how likely is that the corruption charges against Mohidin Yassin are politically motivated, as he has recently claimed. Claimed, what effect will this case have on relationships within the governing coalition? Maybe I'll start with you, James, and then go to Java. Okay. So the way it works in Malaysia, right? For high-profile political cases, everything is political. Uh, to say that it's not political is not true. Uh, the question is that how political it is. And I think that, that remains to be seen. Uh, as to the sort of whether it will affect the Anwar government, the answer is no, it will not affect the Anwar government, other than the fact that in these upcoming state elections, uh, Bersatu, Muyadin's party and Perikatan can't claim to be any cleaner than Amno. You have to understand within the Malay dynamics, right? Uh, Muyadin's party is really a party that is supposed to take over Amno because they claim that they are the clean Amno. In terms of, of, of Muyadin's party, right, the DNA for Besatu is exactly the same DNA as Amno. There's no difference between them, other than the fact that the Besatu leaders have said that we are not involved in corruption. Zahid, Najib, they call them the court cluster. So that's the reason why in Malaysia now they're talking about the second court cluster. The second court cluster refers to the Besatu politicians who are charged for corruption. So other than that dynamic, I don't see them sort of affecting the larger uh, Pakatan Harapan government. Jahaba? Well, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, uh, James said that everything is political because they claim it's political. Uh, what would be interesting is, is if, when the cases actually start, uh, I think uh, Bersatu Perikatan Pass will use it as uh, election for the uh, political fodder when they go campaigning to say it's persecution. Uh, as the same thing that, that Zahid and Najib had said when, when the Mahathir Mohamad government did the same thing. Um, but it'll be the man in the street that will have to decide, the voter will have to decide. Um, were they affected by whatever that was happened during the lockdown when all this perceived corruption was happening? Did they, did they get, did, was this government really clean? Uh, is Muyudin as clean as he says to be or is he being persecuted? I think the government uh, of the day has been very smart in using, in, in not sacking the people who are prosecuting Mohidin Yassin now. It's the same attorney general. It's the same uh, anti-corruption chief. It's the same police chief. So you can't, you, these are the people you appointed. And this is the argument. These are the chaps you appointed. 
right? Now they are going after you. You can't say we are interfering. Because if these were, because every appointment is politicized, it's political, you, now you can't say that this guy's turn against you or I made them turn against you. So it'd be very interesting to see how this plays on. But I, I agree with, with uh, James here that, that the man in the street, the voter now will have to decide whether this, this second court cluster is as corrupt as the first court cluster. And if you look at the amounts of, of money being discussed or, or, or being paid and all that, some are small, small amounts, some are huge amounts. Uh, but it's striking that it's being done in March, about three and a half months before the state elections are being held. It's very quick. I mean, within 100 days, Mm. This government within 100 days went after people we thought they'd never go after. Mm. Uh, so it will continue to fester. <clears throat> Next week, we are going to the fasting month mm. where Muslims are not supposed to smear each other or talk politics. But it will be a major topic of discussion uh, for the for the iftar uh, mm. sessions after, after breaking of fast uh, throughout the night. And I think both sides will have to come up with their strategies to to basically explain themselves, right? Uh, particularly among the Malays, particularly in the six states which are having elections, um, but it won't affect Anwar's government. And, and James is right because uh, the government is made up of different uh, parties, uh, except for one of them who was the finance minister when Muhyiddin and, and Ismail Sabri were in were government were prime ministers, and I think. Um, this gentleman, uh, Tinku Zafrol, uh, is uh, has enough savvy. I mean, this, this guy is an unelected guy. He lost the state in the general elections, right? I think he has enough political savvy and acumen to basically uh, not to be thrown under the bus and then turn it back on this on these chaps and and see them at least have a foot in in jail rather than you know I have no idea whether they will be convicted. Um, mm -hmm. But we, I think, like Najib, will take some time. Uh, but I think the Anwar government, because of all this, will, will have an easier time, at least for the next one year, uh, to coast on this and then do the hard work of trudging along to win, to do enough so that Malaysia will, will vote them into power in, in, in the next general elections in 2027. Yeah, that's what I think will happen. My last question before we wrap up, and it, it's a bit of a nerdy question. It's something that I've focused as, as a former observer in, in the Anwar, the first Anwar Ibrahim trial. Um, um, the judicial system in Malaysia, it's taken a battering since 1988. Um, is that, you know, do you, do you have some hope that uh, it will be reversed? It will, can be brought back uh, from the brink, so to speak? Very quickly, James and then Jahaba. So if you speak to senior lawyers in Kuala Lumpur, uh, most people will say that under this new Chief Justice, uh, things have uh, become a lot, lot better, uh, especially after Najib was found uh, guilty and the appeal was done in one day. So I think a lot of people are quite happy with the way the judiciary is, is moving along. Uh, the problem is that two or three years from now, there will be a new uh, Chief Justice appointed. And unfortunately, I was made to understand that the pool is very, very limited. Mm -hmm. So I think things are going quite well now. Uh, but with the Malaysian judicial system, everything unfortunately depends on two persons. Uh, one is the Chief Justice, the other the President of the Court of Appeal. Uh, if you get the right people in, in these two key positions, then everything will be fine. Uh, if you don't, then there'll be question marks. Jahaba. Well, I, I think, you know, um, the judiciary has sort of cleaned itself off from, from all of what has happened in, from 1988 uh, and the time when Anwar was uh, jailed and all that. Uh, but what is important is going forward, we have a good set of uh, judges now. They're very independent at, at the top level, uh, at, at the levels of... Uh, High Court, Court of Appeal, um, Federal Court, right? What will be interesting is that before uh, the last general election, um, the Prime Minister of the day, Ismail Sabri, had sort of changed the composition of the Judicial Appointment Commission. This is the commission that advises the Prime Minister 
so so then this goes back to the prime minister and then to the to the uh, conference of rulers on who will get promoted and at the senior post uh, in many ways it's a bit like what trump has done in america where you put in uh, conservatives uh, people aligned to a certain viewpoint uh, in in positions where they could choose the next batch of judges so it'll be interesting to see what anwar will do in the next few years also interesting that maybe this power shouldn't be given to the prime minister mm -hmm. to be given to parliament mm -hmm. uh, and this is things which we will have a robust discussion in the next few years in malaysia but there are some people in the appointment uh, commission who are very conservative so while the current batch of judges are independent and and i won't say conservative with their views on how things are run in the country and or, or cases before them we, we will go through a time where there will be a set of judges who will be a lot more conservative than the current batch. And then we might then again revisit this idea whether the Malaysian judiciary has, has restored itself to its former glory. Because there'll always be two, three points to, uh, side, uh, points to this view. Um, and um, I don't know. But I can tell you that, that, that this is something we have to look at, uh, something that parliament has to look at, something that politicians will have to say, look, you know, you want this country to prosper and be better. There must be things which should be institutionalized and should be reformed. Now, whether they have the appetite to do that, I have no idea. But I would say that what happened in America is happening in Malaysia. So there will be a tide of conservatism in our country going forward. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've just passed the hour and a half mark. Um, uh, I would like to wrap this up by first saying thank you very much to, to both our uh, expert speakers, James and, and Jahaba. It's been a very rich discussion and exchange. Um, we've had this, been planning for a while. I'm, I'm happy we were able to do it a bit later than what we initially planned. But with uh, the country of festivals that Malaysia is between Christmas and Chinese New Year, and we managed to snuck it in between uh, a Chinese New Year and, and the fasting month. So I'm glad we, we were able to do that. Um, I'd love the opportunity to come back and talk to you again, you know, maybe in a year's time after the, the elections or the state elections and things have settled down and see what does Anwar's administration look like a year on in. I, personally, I've had a very fun and interesting and rich uh, opportunity here tonight to, to tease out some issues our audience has been, you know, we've had a, a more than more than more than our usual number of webinar audience. Um, and I see some familiar names there, so welcome and thank you. Um, and please, uh, please uh, look out for the the YouTube video, which we hope to be able to produce before too long, and you can distribute to to a wider audience. Um, any final words, James and Jahaba? James? Uh, okay. So, uh, no final words. I think uh, November's, uh, last November's results, although we didn't uh, come up with a, with a clear winner, I think the government put in place with the correct government for today's Malaysia. Thank you, James. Jahaba? Uh, well, all I can say is that I'm sure I'll see James uh, when the six state elections happen. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I'm Malaysian first. I'm always, uh, whether I'm a journalist or not, I'm always a Malaysian. Uh, I like to think that this government is the right government at this point in time. Um, it is a coalition government. It's, it's, a, it's a government that will probably reflect 80% of my aspirations for this country. I, I am just minded to think that, as I mentioned before, there's this conservatism wave in our country. Um, I can I can understand why it's happening in the in the area the rural areas. I can see the fear that that everything will change. That they've been spooked by many things uh, happening in the last fifty years in our country and by a lot of political charlatans uh, po posing as leaders. I just think I hope that that uh, with more interaction, more conversations like this, not just at a regional level but in, within Malaysia. That we can actually get that Malaysia that, that Tunku Abdul Rahman uh, thought about uh, and and did in 1963. I think that that Malaysia is everybody's dream, uh, and, and sort of is still eluding us. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, James and Jahaba, uh, and thank you to the producer Ash Jones, who's been in the background helping us set up. 
uh, our secretary Oliver and the whole committee from AWIA, WA, and also uh, the our our sister organization AWIA, AWIA Tasmania. Thank you for all your support, and hope to speak to you all soon. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you.